All right, hopefully we'll get through patience today. I'm impatient to be finished. <laughs> um, as most of you know from last time, uh, King James Version uses long-suffering, and it's a fruit of the Spirit. And long-suffering is actually a pretty decent translation because the thing that makes patience difficult is that while you're waiting for something to happen, you're normally suffering. So uh, we're going to see that in God's life, the prophet's life, and in ours life. Um, we'll talk hopefully a little bit about suffering as well as patience. So a way to think about it, it's choosing, it's a choice just like the other fruits of the Spirit, to suffer things, offenses and difficulties. So this would be trials, this would be other people usually as God's test, to recognize that he lets these things into our life because Psalm 11 says God tests the righteous. He does that deliberately. First Peter tells us to purify our faith. So we choose to suffer because we know some things, that as we dependently draw on God's grace to do his will, he will act in perfect hesed, justice, and uh, timing. So this knowing is gaining insight into God's purposes, ways, plans, and we're going to hit that again when we get to Colossians 1 down below. It's a key thing that you need for the strength. So, 2 Peter 3, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise, but is long-suffering towards us. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to change their mind and come to repentance and get into a relationship with him. But in the meantime, the, he's living with the offense of his creatures rebelling against him. It's a good model for us to recognize that, yeah, our God doesn't lower the boom immediately. He is willing to endure pain for some higher objective, and we need to do the same thing. <clears throat> um, it's one of the things that's granted to us. If we're wanting to live godly in Christ Jesus, we're going to encounter persecution. And uh, Moses is a good example of someone who um, endured for a long time, difficult times, uh, and one of the things that sustained him was he looked ahead to the reward. I was asked a question last week about the reproach of Christ. Uh, I, I gave one answer, which I wasn't really satisfied with. It, it, to answer that one correctly, you really need to understand the book of Hebrews. Um, the believers are uh, what we would call Messianic Jews, who are being pressured by their Jewish community to go back to Judaism. And they were scorned. The word for reproach is... Uh, you know, scorn, uh, ill will, uh, difficulties. And the author of Hebrews is using the reproach of the Messiah to demonstrate to the original audience that um, they, in following the Messiah, would encounter similar difficulties. Um, there are other commentators who go back and look at uh, Moses' understanding the Messiah would encounter these things, and that is also a particular you know, possibly valid answer. But the thing that was key there is to understand he endured because he saw him who was invisible. If we can keep our eyes on Jesus, we're full to his wonderful face as we sung. Uh, the things that we would suffer on this earth are eh, a momentary light affliction. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when we get down below. And we looked at Psalm 37. Uh, so God as our model for things is long-suffering because he's grieved by sin, and he hopes people will repent. So that's just a pickup from the previous verse. So we looked at God demonstrating uh, long-suffering in his self-disclosure to Moses. This is like the key passage, which, as I mentioned last week, that you need to grasp. This is God specifically saying, this is my name. This is, this is my identity. This is what I'm about. And if you don't get this view about God, you will you know, be off base for the rest of your Christian life. And having spent decades reading what people say about the Christian life, I think I would be justified in saying most people don't get this. They don't understand this concept of God, um, usually as a product of bad teaching. Um, that, oh, yeah, there's nothing between the Old Testament and New. It's all different. No, no, it's the same God throughout. So one of the verses that, uh, went, two of these verses out of Romans that we looked at last week that kind of got me thinking about this, is God desired to show his wrath. He desired to make his power known. But instead, he endured with much long suffering uh, the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. This is in 9, 10, and 11 about the nation of Israel. And uh, you can go back and look at that on your own. Daily Truth Base has the comments on it. 
Um, Romans 2 says the same thing. And then a passage I think is really significant because uh, we have a really good model of God being long-suffering and waiting in the days of Noah. So he was pained by the people to such an extent that he said, I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And he actually did it. But he gave them opportunities to repent, and uh, they didn't take him up on it. So, yeah, fossilized, I guess, somewhere. <laughs> well, if you just understand how the fossil record came about. It's, all right, in, in doing God's will, the prophets who were told to take as an example, um, somewhere in here it says, uh, take, take the prophets as an example of suffering and long-suffering. Different words for suffering there. We're supposed to take them. They suffered as they did God's will. Um, the prophets did not get good reception by anybody. Um, Jesus said, you know, you build monuments to them uh, after they die from the stones that your forefathers threw at them. Um, so, you know, it's funny people would actually even bother honoring them at the end because they're still not obeying them. But the prophets were ones who spoke God's word in the midst of a world that didn't want to hear it, and they suffered. Uh, but they, too, were hoping that people would repent. And I remember... Wow, 30, about 30 years ago, even, even before BAC started, I was preparing um, a bunch of survey courses for New York School of the Bible. And uh, I was doing it up at a walk in the lake in New Hampshire, and I was doing a major prophets. And I came across one of them and said, wow, God said they're not going to pay attention to what he said. And then I looked at the other prophet and Another prophet in Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of them, God said, I want you to go to my people and tell them that they're not following what I want them to do, and they're not going to pay attention to you. And I thought, whoa, like, who wants to sign up for this? <laughs> you know, and, and why did God bother sending them? Uh, you know, he knew they weren't going to be accepted. History shows that they weren't accepted. There were a few that did respond, um, but God vindicated his... Uh, justice by saying, I warned you, I warned you, I warned you, I warned you, I warned you a long time. I was very long-suffering by sending my prophets to you, and you didn't want to hear it. So he was totally justified in uh, eventually giving him the judgment that he had promised. <clears throat> so in James 5, this is the end of James, we're told to be long-suffering. Right, there's our word, until the Lord comes. Oh no, does that mean that I'm going to go through this until the Lord returns? Yeah. <laughs> As the FedEx commercial, any day now, um, well, wait for it. And, but it, it isn't that bad uh, because he says, see how the farmer waits or expects the precious fruit of the earth being long suffering. Okay? So the farmer doesn't get angry over the fact that, oh, the earth is not coming. He's just there waiting. It, it, it's a, you know, this meaning of uh, macrothumia in this passage gives us an idea of that you have to wait. He had to work, and then he waited. You work and you wait. You work and you wait. And at the right time, food comes. It's not like you, you plant and then say, okay, next week, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? No, it, it, it takes time. And it takes God's work in sending the rain and the sun and all those other things. So, uh, I've been doing some sprouts. And uh, you're supposed to rinse them, and you put them on the counter, and then they're supposed to grow up the sprouts. And some some do that. Um, opened up the freezer, and a bag of some seeds came out. And he said, this looks like wheat. Yeah, I guess I'll try sprouting some wheat grass. And I threw it in there and you know, soaked it for the day that it's supposed to soak it. And I look, and there's nothing. So then I waited. And still nothing. So I soaked it a little longer, and rinsed it, and rinsed it, and rinsed it. And then finally, I noticed there was this tiny little bit. And it just... Maybe it's cold, maybe they either you know, got dormant in the freezer or whatever, but eventually they started growing, and uh, I don't know if a few gluten people can eat wheat sprouts, but they actually taste pretty good. So, just like the farmer waits, we are to be long-suffering. And there's another piece that's added to it, of fixing our hearts. Our heart's the spot where we tend to make our decisions, make our decisions according to God's revelation, because the coming of the Lord's at hand. And when he comes back, he judges. Judge begins with us. So we want to do well with that judgment. And that just gives us an added 
incentive to not go the wrong way. Um, don't grieve or grumble against one another, lest you be contemned. That's a fear of the Lord passage. Believers are told not to do this because the judge is standing at the door. Now, you've heard me say multiple times that the fear of the Lord has gone from the land, it's gone from Christendom, but it is still in the scripture and it's still a reality in, from God's perspective. We need to live so that we do well at the judgment seat. And if we love others, we want them to do well at the judgment seat, which is why we will sometimes have to act in a prophetic way to say this is what the word says and this is not happening. Then he says, take the prophets as an example. They spoke in the name of the Lord and they suffered. Um, so I, I'm making good friends with Jeremiah lately. And uh, in this month, I, yeah, I, I like to spend some time in each of the prophets. And I realize people don't have the perspective of the Old Testament. But if you just look at the Old Testament, one of these huge chunks of it, bigger than the law, are the prophets. You know, Isaiah. Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The, these are, and then you have 13 minor prophets. And those are fun to do if we just listen to them every day for a week. And uh, except when you get to Zechariah, that's not as fun because, like, what in the world is he talking about? Um, but it eventually makes sense. And we, we recognize that the prophets didn't always get a good reception. And we kind of want to have a good reception, right? If you say something, you want people to say, oh, yeah, as opposed to, you know, it's like, <laughs> they turn into, I don't know what kind of evil creature, but um, the patient suffering of the prophets is something that, hey, we are have signed up for as well. And here's the reason. We count them blessed who endured. So establish your heart, endure. So endure is, I, I think, I can't remember, because the first put it in, I remembered. Um, it's the other word for patience, the hupomene, um, or it could be the, histamine, the stay in place. But the ones who endured are the ones who were blessed. And we've heard of the perseverance, I believe that's the word for long-suffering, of Job, and seen the end intended by the Lord. The Lord is very compassionate and merciful. The New Testament word for merciful here uh, is probably hesed in the Old Testament. Uh, most frequently the word hesed is translated as merciful. So let's just think about Job. Uh, I, I think about Job a lot, some, some days more frequently than others. Um, because it's the first book of the scriptures. And there's, like, it's a hard book to read because a lot of the stuff that people are saying for almost, like, you know, 35 verses is wrong or not accurate. <laughs> so we tend to just dis dis dismiss it. Um, but in what they're saying, you do get a perspective of this is what the law normally would say, um, but it does not apply to Job. And we know that because in the beginning, God called Job righteous said to Satan, have you beheld my servant Job? He's blameless and upright. He fears God, key point, and eschews evil. Eschew, we don't use eschew anymore, but I kind of like it. It's like, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't go for evil. And then he said, there is no one like him on the earth. So you take the best guy God has got. And what does God have happened to him? Probably the worst treatment that anyone had gotten at that time. And there was an end intended. Right? The end was God's glory. And you have to kind of recognize the battle between God and Satan. Uh, Satan should have obeyed. He didn't. He fell. He lost. Um, but he probably raised an objection. We're not specifically told this in Scripture. You have to kind of infer it. That, oh, you know, you can't, you can't expect me to obey you. And God says, no, I'm going to take these, you know, don't be little lumps of clay that are not going to have your glory, and they will obey me. And Satan says, no, they won't. And God says, oh, yeah, you want to put some skin in the game? <laughs> and the rest of the, that's our world. Yeah? I shoot that thought for a second. Like, okay, so you have, you have a person who fears God. Okay, there's a lot of people who fear God. We're cool with that. Then you have another person who shoes evil. Uh, the same person who shoes evil, a lot of people do that. A lot of people are righteous. A lot of people are kind of going that way. So where is the line that, and a lot of people have hard lives. So those are the things you just described as Job. So where do you draw the line where, okay, Job's situation is different from all these other people who are doing the same exact thing. And then 
you know, well, yeah, where's the line, I guess? How do you define, well, you're not applicable to obeying me and doing all the things that all these other people are, because you've crossed that line. Okay, all of us are, as children of Adam, are on the wrong side of the line to begin with. So then the difficulties that we encounter, there's a sermon I did once upon a time on stupid suffering, a lot of it is a result of our choices, where we please ourselves more than God. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call them righteous because, uh, when hand the scriptures say no one's righteous, a righteous person is someone who's doing this right in God's sight. So some people are righteous in vis-a-vis those around them, but you really have to look at what God has revealed in order to have be right in his sight. So he gave his law to the nation of Israel. This is what's right in my sight. So if you have people following that, yeah, then they would probably fit in the righteous camp. But then they have to follow almost all of what he said. Well, everyone here is righteous. I mean, in, at least in our own perceptions anyway. Um, yeah, to, to the degree that we follow what God has revealed, most of us would also say we don't always follow what God has revealed. To the degree that we do, we are right in God's sight. So, you know, in terms of a line, a line between who and who, only because he's sitting right across from me. But no, but no, like, I mean, you but, know, he's had, he had, like, you know, hardships in the past. He, I don't know if he fears God, but let's just say he really, really respects God. And for this argument, we'll say he fears God. Um, he eschews evil. I keep using the word because you say no one uses it. <laughs> Thank and, you. And, um, you know, he's got these things. He's righteous. He's, like, trying to follow God's word. So he has those things that you described as reasons why Job doesn't have to obey and can kind of get away with certain things. Oh, no, I never said that part. Oh, then I misunderstood. Yeah. No, Job is doing what's right in God's sight, but then God brings all these difficulties into his life. Oh, then I misunderstood. Oh. I, thought, I thought Job had, like, the get-out-of-jail-free card. No, 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 no. But this is why... Yeah, it could. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's a monopoly, Job. Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> Thanks for using a shoe. We should bring it back. All right, everybody try to use a shoe this week and see what happens. Don't <laughs> <laughs> I have issues with your use of a shoe. <laughs> the shoe is on the other foot. All right, anyway. Um, <laughs> All right, thank you for the rest of your being long-suffering with puns. Okay, so... Yes, yes, it is for immortality. <laughs> God had an end and in, intended for Job, and at the end, he doubly blessed him. And I, I don't know how um, Job, Job felt about it, but I'm sure that he was very content with what the Lord had provided for him. He is very compassionate. That word for compassion is uh, you know, an, an, an empathy. And he is, what's a missing word there? Merciful. He, the word for Hesed. He is loyal love. He fulfilled his covenantal obligations to Job by blessing him. Right? So Satan doesn't want us to believe that God will fulfill his promises. You know, that's what you know, Eve, the whole thing is, oh, God doesn't, it isn't really being good. He doesn't mean what he said. You will surely die. But no, God always keeps his promises. And to the degree that we believe that, we will basically seek to master God's promises. Another little verse that I have down here, which I want you to add, because I didn't put it on the outline, is, I don't think it's on the outline, Hebrews 6.15. Uh, this is another use of endured or long-suffering. And the one who is enduring there is the father of faith, Abraham. And he endured and then obtained the promise. Now, the funny thing is, he, a little later in chapter 11, it says, Abe and all the others did not receive the promise because God had something better planned for them. Verse 35 says, only together with the New Testament believers would they get glorified. So he obtained a short-term promise of the land, a short-term promise of the Son, but the full fulfillment of all God's promises to Abraham have not happened yet. And they will not happen until the nation of Israel gets gathered and Messiah comes and rules over them. But I want you to think about Abe and what is said about him that as the father of faith, you don't immediately say, oh, God, I want this, and you get it. You don't get that. You have to endure. And, you know, there's a whole branch of bogus Christianity that says, you know, God wants to bless you now, and God wants to make you rich, and all this other stuff that doesn't really square with the scriptures. 
So we are people who really should not have our um, unsanctified desires be the thing that rules our lives, but the glory of God, we want to see God get glorified through that. Uh, contemporary and popular Christianity appeals to carnal desires to make people happy. Um, the scriptures appeal to eternal desires to make us happy. So now, um, hopefully, oh, the clock, I to make sure I didn't over. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, it's actually three minutes fast. We get to the stuff that makes it applicable to us. We, New Testament believers, need God's power and perspective to walk in a manner that is worthy of him, whatever that means, we'll talk about that a little bit, in doing his will, which is going to involve loving, serving, and trusting in his revelation. So, power is the key thing to endure suffering. Now, in the scriptures, uh, as I understand them, grace is a form of power. Second like Corinthians 12, Paul says, um, I asked God to remove this difficulty of my life, and he said, uh, my power is sufficient, or my grace is sufficient. He says, I'll glory in my infirmities that the power of God might rest upon me. So grace and power are equated there. So we really need God's grace, and it's not just God's grace in terms of, oh, you know, I'll just be nice to you because I want to be nice to you. It's actually it's a merited form of power, and we need to do something to get it, and we're going to see what that is. In 2 Corinthians 6, uh, the previous verses, so Paul and the Church of Corinth didn't have a really smooth relationship. It was actually pretty rocky. Um, you know, he really loved the Thessalonians. He, you know, was very fond of some of the other churches that were following him. Uh, but the Corinthians were always trying to butting heads, and that's why we called them the carnal Christians, because they did not have God's perspective. And in it, he has to defend the fact that he's a servant of God, and he gives all the trials and tribulations and bad stuff that happened to him in the previous verses, uh, by pureness, which is a, a form of chaste holiness, uh, by, I think, this is epigenosis, and there's our word, long-suffering, and the word we're going to look at next uh, fruit is uh, benevolence, kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by love unfeigned, by truth, by the power of God, and the armor of righteousness. In order to be a servant of God, you need those things. You cannot serve God in just your own power, so you, people think you're wonderful, so you think you're wonderful. You actually need God's power to strengthen you. And there's you need the armor of righteousness. Why would you need armor to serve others? Because Satan is opposed to God's will. And if we are doing God's will, you would expect to get opposition. If you're not getting opposition you're probably not doing the right thing. Um, it says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And we fortunately are not persecuted like they are in other parts of the world for following Christ. But you're swimming upstream against a culture that is going downstream. So I want to grasp more of this concept of power. Um, and to do that, I'm going to steal a little of what might be Joseph's sermon uh, next year, so I'm going to give you all of this, uh, and I'm sure you'll all forget it. So, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. so Paul starts nine for this reason, and the reason is the faith and love that come from the hope laid up for them in heaven. So, uh, if you want to be Joseph to the punch? Go and look at what that hope is in chapter one of Colossians, because that's like the only spot where he mentions it. But because they had hope, they then demonstrated faith and love. Right? Because there was hope of reward, they demonstrated those things. And then Paul says, you guys have faith and love. I heard about it. But he's still praying for them. So now what do you need? Well, Paul asks that the believers might be filled, that's a word for controlled, with the, I believe this is epigenosis, or knowledge of his will. So he wants them to do God's will now that they're believers. Kind of makes sense. Paul was given so that people would be moving from darkness to light, the power of Satan to God, and then get an inheritance among those who are sanctified, oh, get forgiveness of sins. That's believe that Jesus died for your sins, and the Father accepts it, and then get an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in Christ. So we go back to Acts 26 or 8, somewhere in there. 
and you find uh, false commission. <clears throat> but in order to do that, you need, this is by means of, all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Um, I spend a lot of time, and I have in past sermons, talking about wisdom. It's the right objectives, it's choosing the right objectives, and choosing the right means of obtaining them. And Proverbs helps you understand what the right thing is and how to do it, which is why I commend to you the Proverb of the Day. I've been doing the Proverb of the Day for 40 years, every day. Yes, I miss a couple days, but then I go back and pick it up. And I still see good stuff in there. I mean, there is, there, it's almost inexhaustible. I mean, like this, each thing has something you could chew on for, pick one verse and chew on it for the day, and you'll still have some meaty juice at the end of the day. Uh, if you're carnivore, I mean, you're, you're non-carnivores, I don't know, which you, you chew on a carrot, and I go with its carrots. <laughs> Whatever you chew on, <laughs> you can chew on it all day, and it's still there. Um, so w wisdom is pretty good. People kind of get that. Uh, the piece that I think is missing is of the spirit understanding. The uh, New Testament word for understanding is you put ideas together. It's sun and then together of some sort. Or sun is together and ideas. And in the Old Testament, it's being, which is like two things coming into one. And the need to put things together from the spirit's perspective is some skill that is lacking in Christendom, it's lacking in the commentaries I read, it's lacking in the sermons I read, hopefully it's not lacking in the sermons I give, but we need to understand life from God's perspective. We have worldly wisdom, worldly understanding, they get you pretty far, but if you want to be pleasing to God, you need to get this spiritual insight, and I'm not talking about anything mystical. This is like no magic, smoke, mirrors, drug-induced states, or anything like that. It's basically understanding life from God's perspective. And the better you know God, the more intimate you are with him, the more you see things from his perspective. Job would have had a much easier time if he had been able to read what God said in chapter 1. <laughs> he just would have said, all right, I'll wait. No sweat. Lord gives, Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'll chill until such time as God chooses to do things differently. But he kind of lacked that understanding of God's perspective on his situation. And so did all his counselors. Elihu got a little bit correct. And then God shows up and says, hey, I'm God, you're not. And fixes everything. So, um, and all that, Job was still righteous. We, we need to really master understanding. Now, people who just say, okay, I'm going to read a chapter a day, and they read a chapter a day, okay, done. Uh, what did you read? I don't know. Oh, it was a chapter. Um, yeah, the, the last chapter I just read. Yeah, that was what I read. Well, what does it mean? What, what does it tell you about God? What does it tell you about what you are like? What does it tell you about the relationship between the two? Um, that stuff is missing, which is why I wrote Daily Truth Base, to get people to reflect on the scriptures like that so they can get God's perspective on life. If you have God's perspectives on life, you can sail through the troubled waters without too much seasickness. Um, Jesus understood okay, I'm going to come and I'm going to do the Father's will and people are going to reject it and I am going to get crucified. And then I'm going to get resurrected. There is that pain part, but God will give me grace to get through it. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to pour out the wrath of the Lamb. I, I, I know sort of how perverse this is, but I chuckle whenever I think of the wrath of the Lamb. Uh, the wrath of the Lamb is incredibly scary. It's what the book of Revelation is about. <clears throat> but the reason I chuckle is because we think of lambs as these meek, mild little things. I mean, sheep are meek, for the most part, meek and mild. Lambs are just like really meek and mild. And then the closest parallel I can think about it, for you Monty Python fans, is the attack <laughs> rabbit. <laughs> oh, a little bunny rabbit. <laughs> you know, and a rabbit. <laughs> Cute little bunny rabbit just ripped their jugular out. You know, it's like... Um, when Jesus comes back, it is not going to be the meek and mild guy in a donkey. He's riding on a war charger, and it is going to be scary. And most Christians throughout history do not read Revelation. Most of the great commentators and reformers said, I don't understand it. Um, it's because they didn't understand how uh, God had a lot of it runs that go back, actually, to Ezekiel and Zechariah, um, where, God, where God revealed some of his plan, and Revelation just fulfills it. Okay, so the reason you need these things... You're controlled by the knowledge of his will is so that you can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, being fully pleasing to him. God expects us to be fully pleasing to him. All pleasing is what it means. That means he really likes everything we do. 
um, which kind of really puts a serious dent in the thought of worm theology. Oh, I can't do anything. It's only Jesus. And, you know, it's all his grace, and I'm just going to continue in my sin and thank God for saving me. It, it's, that's not what it's about. He wants us to know what his will is. Don't be foolish. Hope you're wise, says Ephesians 5. And live in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. It basically gives the Lord worth and value, um, worthy of being a follower of the Lord. Um, I'll let Joseph figure out what that it means, because uh, I'm full of stuff. <laughs> um, we have a little hint of these things. You're going to be fruitful in every good work. So that means you're going to be doing good work. Ephesians 2 says you're saved to do good works. You're going to bear fruit. Jesus said, John 15, you, know, you bear much fruit, so you show prove to be my disciples. My father gets glorified in it. And you're going to increase in your epigenosis of God. So it's knowing God is uh, his creator, he uh, sent his son, he's coming back again, and all's good. Um, all right, so we know that about God. Now, let's increase that. So that's why you go through the scriptures to say, what does this tell me about God? Of all the ways that could be communicated, or any, well, the manner of communication, the content of communication, God chose a specific way to communicate to us. So specific that Jesus said, not a jot or a tittle will pass away. So we really need to commit ourselves to understanding the scriptures every way possible. Understand why it's written, why what's not there. I was really uh, gratified when I uh, sat in one of the Bible studies in Romans where people were saying, well, why, why, what's not there? That's what we need to look at. Um, as opposed to what actually is there. That means they're thinking. And I said, yeah, we warned you about that, but <laughs> uh, it's a good thing to do. So it's only when that happens, or actually in making that happen, uh, that, or yeah, in order to make this happen, we need to be strengthened. Oops. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. That takes it totally beyond human power. But to think of the glory of God that said, let there be, and there was, boom, there's an earth. Wow, how'd that get there? Um, and then smite, and then, wow, the earth just smelted. What happened? That kind of power is available to believers. Why don't we see it? Uh, God has some purpose and plan to kind of give it to us as we need it. And two verses that I think are worth noting. Uh, Hebrews 11.34 uses a form of this word where it talks about those who had no strength went to a position of strength. And then similar thought is in Romans 4.20, I believe it's about Abraham, um, who you know, basically was hopeless. You know, hey, 80-year-old dude with an 80-year-old wife, uh, you're going to have a kid. And you know, he looks at himself and Sarah and says, we're dead. How can we have a kid? And God says, uh, you're going to have a kid. And then he was str strong in faith. Um, some of the versions say strengthened in faith, but he was strong in believing God. And that is the key to getting strengthened, is to believe what God has revealed, to believe his promises. And if you don't know his promises, you can't believe them. If you don't correctly understand his promises, you'll be believing incorrectly. Strengthen that so you'll have all might or power. And then, what do you do with all that might and power? You trample down your enemies. no. You have all patience, oops, which is the word for endurance, and long-suffering, but with joy. Bring it on, because I know it's ultimately for my benefit. So if we really can grasp that, then we'll have strength to face the difficult times. Difficulty is part of the life. Um, we should be giving thanks to the Father for this stuff. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Uh, because the Father has qualified us, he basically put us into position to get the inheritance of the saints in the light. So uh, it's not automatic, you're qualified. So anybody who's done sales, you have to qualify your lead to make sure that they can actually pay for the stuff. Um, the illustration I used to give of this, and I'll give it again, is uh, when Jill first started working with IBM, <clears throat> they had a matching gift program. And uh, whatever we would give to a charitable cause, uh, IBM would match two to one. Those were back in the good old days when IBM had lots of extra money. And uh, we were really happy about that because we were purposing to give in such a way that God would get glorified. And it got matched. Some of our co-workers, they weren't excited about it at all because they hadn't given anything to anyone to participate in it. 
wasn't that two to one matching gift program great? Eh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I guess so. But yeah, you know, we thought it was great because we were actually participating in the thing. Okay, another verse on this um, in chapter three, Colossians. Um, Therefore, in light of the need to set your affections on things above, when Christ was our glory is revealed, you'll also be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, you got to do a little change here. You need to put off the bad stuff, and then you need to put on um, some characteristics. Uh, mercies, benevolence, which is goodness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. Those are things that we have to wear. They have to become part of us. And then that enables us to bear with one another. And that means put up with a door. And forgive one another. Um, normally our suffering is due to other people doing things that aren't that causes pain. Um, and the normal response to pain, believe it or not, is anger. One of these days I'll do a sermon on that. Um, but it's one of the most frequent expressions of feeling pain and rejection is to express anger. Instead, we bear with one another because we have these characteristics and we forgive one another. This is one of the one other passages, commands given to believers to, in terms of how they interact with each other. And if you have a complaint against someone else, which is usually legitimate, and most of our complaint, we're not bizarrely crazy people, just moderately crazy. Um, we are supposed to forgive, but notice that the it's not a blanket statement. It's as Christ has forgiven you. Now, how has Christ forgiven us? Uh, on what basis does he forgive us? On the basis of Christ's death. Um, how do we actually get that forgiveness? We stop fighting against God, and we lay down our arms, and we say, okay, God, I was wrong, your way. So Jesus said, oh, I can't remember what this is, I should know. Um, I think it's 9 or 12 uh, in Luke. Jesus, uh, Peter asked Jesus, uh, you know, about forgiving, and he says, you know, if your brother sins against you, go tell him, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And then it, Peter says, well, what if he does it again? What if he does And then Jesus says, you keep doing it. So um, there needs to be forgiveness uh, granted even before a person repents. Uh, that comes out of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6, where Jesus, in the Lord's Prayer, the only piece that's elaborated on there is you need to forgive others so your Heavenly Father will forgive you. And it's not a talk about forgiving for your uh, sins and going into the lake of fire, but it's for fellowship with God. So if you look at Daily Truth Base, you can find out more about that. The audience already had their sins covered by the Day of Atonement. So we need to be forgiving and granting forgiveness to people even before they seek forgiveness. Now that even adds to our long suffering. But it's what God wants us to do. Above all these things, put on loves, agape, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, that the thing that controls us, and be thankful. And then comes, let the word of God dwell in you richly, with all wisdom, as you teach and admonish one another. So in order to deal with erring believers, you kind of need to have, A, number one, the word of Christ dwelling in you richly. You need an insight that he prayed for them in chapter one. And it needs to be at home in your life richly. Then, in wisdom, from God's perspective, remember in chapter one he talked about how to get that wisdom? You can then teach and admonish or warn one another. Um, a couple other verses that it might be helpful on this. An aspect of love, agape, is long-suffering and benevolent. Uh, most of your versions will say something like patient and kind. Uh, these are two fruits of the Spirit that are next to each other. Uh, the next time, we, next fruit we look at, the concept of kind or benevolent is actually useful. It's doing good to others. And uh, I think that kind of has gotten distorted as well with the concept of kindness. But obviously, you be kind. Um, another spot of from admonishing comes up to uh, believers, believers, this is, are charged with uh, encouraging the feeble-minded, um, warning the unruly, holding against the weak, and be long-suffering towards all. Support the weak is another translation of that, but we've got a previous sermon. You'll see a different take on it. First Peter, Paul's comment to Peter, not First Timothy, my bad. Paul's comment to him is that Paul obtained mercy, that Christ might show all long suffering as an example to those who should believe on him for eternal life. So 
Paul was actually a pretty bad dude before he became a believer, before he met Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He forgave him and he put him back in service. And that should be our attitude towards people. We don't hold over them something in the past. We um, basically forgive like Christ forgave and uh, move on from there. Uh, wow, I remember my first, uh, was first year I was married. Yeah, early, no, actually before that, early on, my first year as a believer, I came across a book called Paul, the Man Who Shook the World by a guy called John Pollock. And I read it and it was, you know, it sh sh shook up my world and totally changed my perspective. And I read it, you know, 25 years later, and I was thinking, oh, this isn't so earth shattering. But back then, <laughs> it was phenomenal um, to understand how Paul worked and to realize that this Paul's really a good model for us because we get more of him in the New Testament than uh, anyone else besides Jesus. And he said to Timothy, hey, you've known my teaching, you've known my manner of life, you've known my purpose, what I live for, you've known the faith and belief that I have in the Lord's promises, You've known my long suffering. So uh, I'm sure Paul and Timothy are sitting around, and Paul has just gotten abused. And he says to Timothy, Oh, yeah, this long suffering stuff. I, I've learned to suffer in silence. Want to see it? Want to, want to see it again? <laughs> you know, he's just there. So, you know, he, Paul, somehow Timothy knew that Paul was enduring long suffering. They knew that he had love, they longed that he had hupomene, the endurance, patience. The, you know, the persecutions, the afflictions. And then he goes on to say, and out of all of this, the Lord delivered me. It doesn't say from all of this, the Lord delivered me, but as I was in it, the Lord delivered me out of it. And uh, by the way, he says in the next chapter, and I'm going to get martyred real soon. Um, and then he gives the promise that nobody claims, that I never see this in a precious promise book um, with all the you know, cute little characters, like all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, right? So that's what we're signing up for. So if that's what we are headed for, I know a lot of us are experiencing that, then what we need to do is get God's strength to do that. And we get God's strength from getting his perspective on the stuff that affects our lives. And then we can have grace to help us in time of need. I, when I was down at Dallas Seminary, uh, they, someone had donated a new student center, and they put this great fountain, and in the middle of the fountain was the model for the school, preach the word. They never put the rest of the stuff up that goes with that. Uh, it's the word for proclaim. Uh, later in the same epistle, it's used for do the work of an evangelist, but it's really to proclaim the word, and then be in season, in season, and out of season. And then it tells you what's supposed to go in there. Reproving, bringing sin and nonconformity to God's word to light. Rebuke, to basically... Um, say no to people when they're doing the wrong thing. And then exhort, that's actually our word for paracleto, encourage, with all long suffering and teaching or doctrine. And then he tells them why he's going to need these things. He doesn't say, preach the word and have everybody come forward and we can all shout, hallelujah. You know, that's not what he says. He says it's, it's going to come a time, and I think we've been in this time for a while, and I'm sure most. Uh, the local preachers have thought this of their age as well. When people will not, now the word is endure, but it's also the word that's forbear. They won't put up with sound doctrine. But instead, they're going to heap to themselves teachers who will tickle their ears. And I, I just kind of look sadness at, I think, of my colleagues um, over this past generation, how they have basically been persecuted by their own congregations for teaching what the scripture says. And then I've seen some move to saying what is going to cause them less flack. They're still trying to teach the word, but they soft pedal the things that people don't want to hear. And you have the carnal people in a congregation controlling what gets said. And it's just tragic because now the people of God don't have truth. They have just this diluted stuff that doesn't really work or only works in certain circumstances. So the correction to that is the word that God has revealed, which he said in 2 Timothy, Timothy 3, you need to study. Is that 1 Timothy? 
And then in Second Timothy, the discipleship passage, it's given for you know teaching, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, or training in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. <clears throat> um, I think I have two more verses on here. I think we go see what we've got down here. Am I at the end of this? Yes. yes. I hope I'm back. Back. All right. <clears throat> Hebrews 6, again, this was the um, <clears throat> Abraham passage. We want you to show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope to the end and not be a sluggard, not be a lazy slug, but um, be diligent to oh, imitate those who through faith and long suffering inherit the promises. So we want to get an inheritance that lasts forever. Um, it's not going to happen if we are just slugs. We need to put the same amount of effort and pursuit of God and his word into our spiritual life as we do in any other endeavor. And one of the reasons I was attracted to New York City, apart from being a native, is there are people here who really know how to pursue objectives. And that's why they are successful. And it's attracted people from all over the world who know how to pursue their objectives. Yet, so little of that goes into pursuing their spiritual life. And, you know, one of the first sermons I did when I was up at uh, New York School of the Bible, in the church that was associated with it, was uh, Malachi. I preached the book of Malachi. And I basically entitled it, Lord of the Leftovers. And unfortunately, that's why people, they don't give the Lord the priorities. They just give him whatever is left over. They don't even give him the appetizer. <laughs> um, they just... Consume, 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 and oh, whatever time and energy I've left, oh, well, you know, I'll give that to God if, if, if I feel like it. Which is really not a way to earn God's favor and approval and be fully pleasing to him. He actually hates it. So uh, you want to give him what he likes, not what he dislikes. So that means we need to imitate those who, through faith, belief in God's promise, and then the perseverance, the long-suffering, we put up with whatever difficulty it takes. Insert here, Iron Man marathon running story. Um, so we eventually get to the finish line. And then a little verse that I think is worth ending on. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which every night and day cry out to him, though he bear long, he suffers long with them? So notice that the, the choice people of God cry out to him day and night because, this is King James, um, the, there are difficulties. And we need to be, you know, watching and praying and enduring and doing all the good stuff, knowing that God will one day set everything right. Now, knowing that there's that final exam, knowing that there's that final accounting, knowing that there is the final, you know, uh, opportunity for vindication, you want to make sure that you're going to live in such a way that that happens. And then you can demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, which is long-suffering. And, ta-da! <laughs> One minute left for questions. <laughs> Thank you for suffering through this sermon. I know it was long. The, the, the very yeah. last verse from Luke, um, so God shall avenge his own elect and will cry out to him, though he bears long with them. Does that mean he is grieved by his own elect? He's, no. no? He, he is... Uh, grieved uh, probably along with them. They're suffering, which is why they're calling out. God's not grieved with the people who come to him. Like Hebrews uh, 4.12, let's boldly come before the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. God never says, what are you doing here? Gabriel, get the club. Get him out of here. <laughs> you know, he, he definitely is. Uh, he, Jesus basically uh, bears with us, the Spirit bears with us, and I don't know if uh, that's out of Romans 8. I can't think of a particular verse that says God uh, bears with us, except maybe this one. Would you say the difference between long suffering and waiting is that long suffering is just a version of waiting? Um, so the, there's a guy called Bishop Trent. He wrote a book called The Cinnamons in the New Testament. Uh, some of you have looked up. It's kind of hard to read because he uh, transliterates into English the Greek words. At least I find it difficult to read as opposed to just the Greek letters. He, he does a good job on the distinction of it. Um, fortunately, he starts out the article quoting other people and then refuting, and then he gets down to his own view. For the most part, 
endurance is something where you really don't have an other choice. Like your boss says, I want you to work on Thanksgiving weekend. And you don't really have a choice if you want to keep getting your paycheck. That is enduring. It's bearing up under the burden and God gives help for that. Um, long suffering tends to be more of a choice, but you know, remember, um, we looked at endurance under joy and there are some choice elements of it there. You're choosing to do what's right. Um, long suffering is there's a, basically something that you have an easier opportunity to run away from under enduring you're under a burden that's already there and long suffering would be easy to go away from, but you don't until it's time to act. So a lot of the endurance verses, not all of them, a lot of them are to the end, uh, long suffering. Some of them are to the end, but uh, if you think about God demonstrating this long suffering, there was an ending, you know, uh, Genesis six, when the flood came, that was the end. Um, when Jesus comes back, it's going to be the end. So that's part of the difference between them. Um, one is just bearing under it, and the other is a, suffering is an active choice to not have the wrong response. It's like really hard. Enduring is, okay, I just got to stay here and not give up. So enduring is a shorter, you know, it's like you're running a marathon, and you just, you know, you have to just put one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, in front of the other, repeat ad infinitum, and get across the finish line. Uh, Long suffering is possibly even a little harder because you have more options open to you, but that's we're, we're getting to a pretty fine distinction here. A lot. Get released from their suffering. Yeah. Yeah. So I would encourage you to think about things that you would rather not have in your life, things that cause you suffering. I'd encourage you to look at them from God's perspective. That's where that spiritual insight and wisdom come from. And then to exercise faith in the promises that God has. And then you will be demonstrating this fruit in your life. And remember, the Spirit wants to help you do this. He's at work in you to cause you to desire and do this. So it's, it's not as hard as it sounds. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God who tests his righteous. That even though you uh, bring trials and difficulties into our lives for our benefit, even though you let Satan buffet us, um, you give us all that we need to do your will and to be fully pleasing to you. Uh, thank you that your word is always faithful so we can trust it completely, implicitly, and stake our lives on it. And thank you that your spirit also works in helping us and strengthening us so that we might have great endurance. I pray that you would protect our body and each of us as we seek to do what is pleasing in your sight. For that is why we live. We pray these things and ask for... A blessing on our lunch in Christ's name. Amen.